Hello and welcome to the Eastern Front. My name is Yulia Zhoja. I'm with the Middle East Institute, Georgetown and George Washington Universities, and I'm joined by... Giselle Donnelly. I'm with the American Enterprise Institute, and I'm a senior fellow there. And Al Guruhaj, also with AI and also a senior fellow. On our podcast, we talk about the many challenges to European peace that tend to emerge along a line running from the Baltic to the Black Sea, the Eastern Front, and about why those matter to the United States. Um, today, we are joined by Franak Biachorka, who is the chief political advisor of Svetlana Tsihanouskaya um, of Belarus. If you enjoy enjoy this episode, please consider subscribing, rating, and reviewing us. Franak, thank you so much for um, joining us today. We want to start broad. Um, there's certainly a lot of um, things in the news right now, <clears throat> including on Belarus and Russia. And that's the broad question that we want to hit you with first. And that's um, specifically the sort of st stealth annexation of Belarus by Russia. Can you tell us a little bit or kind of um, get us into the topic of what has been happening through um, the full-scale invasion over the last one plus years in terms of Belarus being slowly absorbed uh, into um, Russian decision-making? Of course, of course. Uh, you know, Belarus is the victim of Russian aggression and uh, Belarus became the victim before the full-scale invasion um, against Ukraine. Uh, Russia started to russify, we call it russify Belarus a long uh, time before 2022. Uh, Russia dominated Belarusian economy, Belarusian uh, political sphere, and basically Lukashenko, who is leading the country for 28 years, he was always playing the role of uh, Putin's puppet, Putin's governor of Belarus. Why? Why it happened? I think it uh, started a few centuries ago when Belarus was part of the uh, Russian Empire. Belarus language was uh, almost prohibited in the country and Belarusian uh, nation was artificially integrated into Russian society. And uh, right now, uh, in 2023, uh, Russia is saying that Belarusians are same as Russians and they are part of Russian world, Ruski Mir, they call it. And uh, this is why uh, Russia uh, must have full control over Belarus. Uh, we uh, saw in 2022, in the first day of invasion, that Russian tanks moved to Kiev from Belarus territory because it is a shortcut to, to Kiev through Chernobyl. And without uh, assistance of Lukashenko, the invasion probably wouldn't start it at all. For Putin, it was a real uh, present. It was real luck uh, to have uh, a weak and fully controlled Lukashenko. Uh, but fortunately, thanks to Ukrainian defenders, thanks to Ukrainian resistance, uh, this attack on Kyiv in the first days of invasion, it failed. And also it thanks to Belarusian people who resisted a lot to Russian invaders. In that context uh, of, of the invasion, could you walk us through the thinking behind both sort of Lukashenko regime and, 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 and Putin regime, which basically... Uh, state clear of using Belarusian armed forces directly in the war and, and Belarus is in a sort of intermediate sort of situation where it's under Russian occupation where it serves as a, as, a, as a base for the Russian forces but thus far it has not joined the fight uh, directly. Is there an advantage for the Russians to, to keeping Belarus in that kind of intermediate position? Is it likely to change over time? What, what, what your thinking is? We were afraid that Belarusian army could join the invasion and there was such probability in spring and summer 2022. But months after months in Belarusian society, the consensus was formed that Belarus should not participate in this war. And uh, on one hand, it is because of uh, Belarusian soldiers uh, who didn't want to take responsibility for Putin's crimes. On the other hand, it is because of Belarusian society, which took the war very negatively. Uh, if Lukashenko, let's imagine, would give such order Okay, Belarusian soldiers, now you go to Kyiv to help our brothers Russians. Uh, there is a high probability people, uh, army soldiers, officers, they will put down their arms, they will defect, they will change sides, they will surrender to Ukrainians. And this is the reason why Putin and Lukashenko didn't take such a decision. 
they didn't uh, want to risk of unpredictable development which which might take place but they still continued to use belarusian infrastructure belarusian airfields belarusian hospitals for example russian tanks which were damaged in fights on the eastern front of ukraine they are being repaired in belarusian facilities but no Belarusian soldier entered Ukraine so far, and we will do all possible to prevent Belarus participation in the war. Uh, before we get to more detailed questions, I think it would be useful for our audience, which is that has a lot of Americans, to get your take on Lukashenko himself. He's been there forever, you know, almost three decades. But to many Americans, he remains a poorly known figure who, who can sort of be easily caricatured. Um, so, Farnak, maybe you could give us, like I say, your take on uh, Lukashenko, the survivor, or you know, the guy who's held on to power for all this time. Oh, it's difficult uh, to, to describe. Um, I was six years old when he came to power, so I just uh, I went to my first uh, year of school, and uh, I remember the first election. Uh, my father took me to the uh, voting station. We didn't vote for Lukashenko. Then he became the president, and next year there were huge protests. And I remember how people were falling, police were using tear gas, and my father was always in prison on my birthday because my birthday is always next day after. Uh, after Belarus Freedom Day uh, and all my life it was under uh, Lukashenko's rule uh, and I don't remember myself without Lukashenko. And uh, when I was 13 years old, I was uh, arrested for the first time. All over, I was more than 20 times in prison. I spent two years in isolation in, in a jail or in a prison because they use, uh, or in the army, because they use army also as the form of imprisonment for young activists. And uh, Lukashenko was building uh, step by step, brick by brick, the power vertical, uh, the totalitarian system. And when in the end of 90s, when Lukashenko came to power, it was possible to imagine changes, transformation, evolution of political system. Right now, in 2023, it's impossible. It's, it is like a Stalinist uh, system, Stalinist regime, when KGB can come to everyone's house without any notification, they can arrest anyone without any decision of, of court, of, of uh, judge. Uh, I, I do believe this is what Lukashenko wanted all his life. Fully controlled society, uh, obeying loyal system, militarized power vertical, and right now he has what he always wanted to have. People are afraid of doing anything because of possible punishment. And um, I, I don't really believe in any evolution of the system. This is why uh, revolutionary changes and building the new Belarus from scratch is uh, the only viable option, in my opinion. And in 2020, when Belarusian democratic revolution has started with the beautiful protests on the, on the streets of Belarusian cities, we actually wanted to, to, to crack the system, to collapse it in full, and to build the new democratic Belarus. Unfortunately, we are not yet there. So then what does it take to get there in your understanding? You said yourself that you don't have any memories without clearly not your favorite person, Lukashenko, <laughs> um, and, uh, and highlighted the difficulties of removing him from power peacefully. And you mentioned revolution, but what would it take from the inside and from the outside in, in a sort of regional context for Lukashenko's regime to fall? Uh, we were hoping that Lukashenko's regime can fall without the fall of Putin. Uh, but after 2020, uh, we realized that we were wrong. Uh, we realized that Putin and Lukashenko's regime, they are intertwined. They, are, uh, they have symbiotic relationship. They need each other. And it will be very difficult, but still possible, to change the system in Belarus without changing the system in Russia. Uh, you saw how much uh, Putin is supporting Lukashenko right now. They are meeting each other every week almost or having phone calls. It's like, you know, the, uh, this unhappy marriage, you know, they might hate each other, but they still meet each other because they need each other and they're connected to, to each other. I, I do believe that the war in Ukraine changed a lot. Uh, this status quo, it uh, created the new factor, 
which might impact the changes in Belarus and definitely can cause the collapse of Lukashenko's system. We see how people around Lukashenko are reacting sensitively to all changes on the Ukrainian front. Uh, they are seeing how they are seeing they are watching every Ukraine success and they feel that situation might change in Belarus too. And they come to us, they come to the office of Svetlana Tikhanovskaya, uh, trying to build or guarantee or secure um, uh, the future for themselves. And it gives me hope. It, it gives me hope because I see that there is no solidified system, solidified regime as we always believed. There are many people around Lukashenko who hate Lukashenko as well, but they also react to every change of the wind. And I hope when situation will be changing in Ukraine, Ukrainians will be winning, Russia will be weakening, we will see changes in Belarus happening very, very quickly. If I can ask uh, just a follow-up question on the interconnectivity or the unhappy marriage, as you um, very illustratively call it, between Lukashenko and uh, Putin, over the years, much earlier than the full-scale invasion, we knew from Lukashenko statements here and there and allusions that one of his main dreams um, in order to solidify his power is to host Russian nuclear weapons on the ground. And that has seems to have been, according to Russian statements, come true. We saw Putin um, recently declaring that by July 1st, the storage facilities for nuclear weapons will be um, finalized. But we also saw um, Lukashenko asking recently in a meeting with Shoigu um, what other security guarantees um, Russia can provide for Belarus, because Belarus, according to Lukashenko, needs more security guarantees in, in the possibility of an attack from who knows who. So in your understanding, how do you interpret um, this move of nuclear weapons? Is it really solidifying the relationship and the quasi-annexation? Or is it just uh, just rhetoric um, to make uh, Lukashenko seem more powerful than he is? This is a very dangerous development. Of course, we knew that uh, nuclear weapons in Belarus, it was always Lukashenko's dream. It was his childhood dream. When he came to power, he accused uh, the previous democratic government of Belarus of giving up uh, nuclear weapons. Because according to Budapest Memorandum, Belarus, Ukraine, Kazakhstan, they gave their uh, nukes to Russia. And Lukashenko felt uh, that, oh, if he would have nukes, he would be much more powerful and the West will not impose sanctions. Uh, right now, uh, he hoped that Putin will give him nukes. But it seems that Putin doesn't want to give nukes to Lukashenko. Putin wants to put nukes on in Belarus and to control them in Belarus. If it happens and there is high probability, it will it will fix Putin's control over the country. So even when changes in Ukraine happens, Ukraine wins, Putin might say that, uh, guys, I have my nukes in Belarus. This is why Belarus must be in my sphere of influence. This is a big danger for Belarusian sovereignty and Belarusian future at all. So we must do all possible to prevent it from uh, from happening. Uh, I think um, it might be already solved uh, deal uh, in minds of Lukashenko and Putin. The question is when. Will they do it this year? Will they postpone it until next year? I think right now they are waiting for the Western reaction. If the reaction will be strong enough, preventive sanctions will be imposed. It can actually delay the deployment of nukes in uh, on Belarus territory. If they see that the West ignore or doesn't pay much much attention, they can speed up the process, and that 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 this that then danger will be huge, uh, not only for Belarusian sovereignty, but security um, uh, in the whole Eastern Europe region. On that note, uh, I was wondering what your thoughts were on the, the European and, and, and Western policies towards Belarus more broadly. I remember in 2020 when Koshenko basically stole the election in the summer. It took the European Union a couple of months, really, until October to impose a sanctions regime on Belarus, on, on the Lukashenko regime, because 
Cyprus, for whatever reason, was, was holding the decision back because of its own disputes with Turkey, wanted to have Turkey sanctioned as well. Since then, obviously, we've seen numerous new packages of sanctions, particularly in the context of the war in Ukraine, imposed both on the Lukashenko regime and on Russia itself. Do you think the existing sanction regime is adequate? Is it likely to produce any kind of sort of behavioral change on part of the regime? Are there any obviously obvious sort of you know, leaky aspects to the regime where, where, where the elites or people connected to Lukashenko can get around the sanctions. What would you like to see, you know, European institutions, the United States to put in place in the in the coming weeks and months? Oh, look, I think we all know that sanctions are not silver bullet, but so far this is the most powerful uh, instrument the international community can have over regimes like Lukashenko or Putin's. Sanctions are working. We see how the oligarchs and Lukashenko's cronies react uh, to sanctions. They are painful. They deprive them of millions of uh, dollars every month. Um, even people around Lukashenko with their businesses, they are affected so much and they can impact uh, the people in Lukashenko's administration, especially the sanctions on oil, on oil products, on fertilizers, on potash, uh, main sources of uh, Lukashenko's economy. The problem with sanctions is that they need, uh, they must be monitored. They must be enforced. Yes, you can impose so much sanctions as you wish, but if you don't control how they're implemented, they are not useless, but they're not efficient enough. And we see, for example, like right now, how uh, Lukashenko's regime is circumventing sanctions through Kazakhstan through Armenia, even through Turkey. Today we heard uh, that Hungary is helping to avoid some, some sanctions imposed by the European Union on Lukashenko's regime. And we are, we are happy that EU assigned a special person the sanction coordinator uh, on the EU side. And there is also coordination with the US side with uh, O'Brien, who is the U.S. State Department coordinator on sanctions. And it will be great if they will elaborate the mechanism to control and quickly react on every attempt to um, evade sanctions. And also to work with third countries, for example, United Arab Emirates. You know, they help Lukashenko to hide money, we know it. But uh, because of lack of coordination and cooperation with Emirates, uh, the... Um, imposed sanctions on bank accounts of Lukashenko's officials, or officials were not efficient enough. They just, uh, they knew that the sanctions will be imposed. They received a list of individuals who will be sanctioned and they managed to relocate their money to Dubai or Abu Dhabi, for example. And this is also the problem of the West, uh, how to avoid bureaucratic procedures and take strong steps and prevent possible sanction evasion. I wonder if we could uh, turn to um, the Ukraine war and its possible effects in Belarus, but but maybe more broadly too. And in in particular, so everybody in the United States is sort of on the edge of their seats, waiting for the uh, long anticipated Ukrainian counteroffensive operation, which many people hope will. Um, sort of continue uh, the successes that the Ukrainians enjoyed near the end of last year. Uh, and it also is pretty clear that uh, in Bakhmut and elsewhere that that Russian military power has ebbed, shall we say. And, and one other sort of very central issue here in Washington is the expectation that whatever success Ukraine may have, it is probably not going to be sufficient to sort of bring the war to a conclusion for a whole host of reasons. I know this is kind of a long and winding question, but I'd be very much interested in your expectation of what is to come and what the implications might be for for Belarus, and in particular, whether it's possible to imagine a weakening of Putin's grip on, on power. Nobody knows uh, how long the war will, uh, will continue, and uh, we can build scenarios, build plans, imagine possible developments, but uh, as life showed, you know, it can have a very unexpected turns. I, I do believe that in any case, no matter how war stops, uh, will it be frozen, uh, will it end with a victory of Ukraine, uh, Russia will be weakened anyway, weakened uh, politically, economically, psychologically, and this will open the window of opportunities for Belarus. 
every success of Ukrainian army gives us more and more hope for changes in Belarus too. I also do believe that changes in Belarus can come even before the war in, in Ukraine ends or, or got frozen because the system of Lukashenko uh, is very fragile, is very vulnerable right now, and people around him will not be so loyal as Russian officials loyal to Putin. And I think if these people around Lukashenko will feel that Ukraine might really win and will have success on battlefield, uh, they might take strong steps. They can arrest Lukashenko, they can uh, disobey his orders, uh, they can announce that Belarus right now take uh, position in support of Ukraine, for example, going against Russian forces. Of course, uh, right now, today, it sounds like uh, something from fantasy world, uh, something like fiction, uh, but you know, uh, the situation is changing a lot. So do, do you think any of that can happen while Belarus is still de facto under Russian occupation? I mean, I'm asking this as a genuine question. I mean, we had, you know, Czechoslovakia had a velvet revolution while it was under Soviet occupation. Soviet forces were instructed to stay in the barracks, but that was Gorbachev. That was 1989. I mean, what do you think would happen in Belarus today? At this moment, we have four or five thousand Russian soldiers. Most of them are just drafted a few months ago, not prepared, not ready. A few hundred officers. Of course, Russia can send new troops, new tanks to control Belarus. But the question is, will it be able to send it? We see that Russia don't have enough weapons even to stop Ukrainian counteroffensive. Uh, so uh, I'm not sure if Russia will be in the power uh, to control Belarus. It's a big country. It's 10 million countries. And with the, it is the country with a strong society. After 2020, people were mobilized for resistance. So everything, everything is possible. But of course, if nuclear weapons will be deployed, it can change a lot of the balance of, uh, of power. So it's it's hard it's hard to predict the next months even next weeks what what will happen but we must be ready for all possible scenarios and uh, we saw it in the beginning of the war when we had 50 60000 russian soldiers almost in every region of belarus and people still found bravery to resist them. It, it happened in the beginning of war when we had 50,000. Right now we have much less. And I think if there will not be much Russian soldiers on Belarus territory, situation uh, potentially might uh, might change quickly. Okay, can I just, I'm sorry, interject, because if Russia is stretched thin, which we see is obviously true, it does seem to me that the deployment of even tactical nuclear weapons that would be carried by aircraft, which would be the most easy to recover, I think, uh, for the Russians, to, to, to put those weapons into Belarus in, you know, without a f completely firm foundation strikes me as, uh, you know, a better threat than a reality. So I've always you know, sort of had this question since the issue has come up of whether this is just a trial balloon that that would be very risky and would carry with it great dangers if the Russians were to seriously go through the process of deploying nuclear weapons in Belarus. It's one thing to build storage shelters, but you know you have to secure that you've got. To, it's a heavy effort to guard, to secure, on and on and on the deployment of any sort of nuclear forces. And it, again, it just it just strikes me as a you know a risk that the, would be somewhat foolhardy for the Russians. I mean, we carry costs. No, no, you're, you're absolutely right. You know, it's the threat of deploying uh, nuclear weapons, uh, perhaps even more important than the deployment of them itself. But on the other hand, we see how Putin is playing. He's trying to escalate. Uh, he's not always behaving rationally. Uh, I think from their point of view, it must play the deterrent effect. And uh, even the West will think twice if there will be nuclear uh, warheads on Belarus territory, if they should, for example, support uh, underground resist because of possible escalation. Also, you know, they might organize some provocations which will create the feeling that this nuclear weapons might be really used and uh, this also will uh, possibly can deter Plus, it will force Poland, Lithuania, uh, NATO, NATO allies to increase their uh, presence on the on the border with Belarus as well, 
which means more expenses of the West on, on defense. Uh, I think this is their reasoning you know, behind this step. I, I really want to hope and believe it won't happen, uh, but uh, we must be ready that this, this will happen. And we see how propaganda of Lukashenko is working right now, trying to convince Belarus society that nuclear weapons are good for people, it will increase security, blah, blah, blah. Uh, it's hard to uh, convince Belarusians who survived Chernobyl. You know, third part of Belarus territory was contaminated by radiation. And now Belarusians are convinced that the nuclear weapons are good f- and good for their safety. Um, just to uh, to change slightly the topic, um, I'm wondering if you can give us a bit of your assessment of the scale of political crackdown by Lukashenko. Um, we know that when dictators feel extra threatened, um, they crack down politically more. And you mentioned that you've been in and out of prison many times, but hasn't over the past couple of years or so, the political crackdown been intensified by Lukashenko and is that then a sign of him feeling increasingly threatened? Uh, Tihanuskaya herself was sentenced for treason to what 15 years in absentia. Um, we see over the past few weeks um, increasing deportations or extraditions of um, of people from Belarus um, to Russia and very heavy um, prison sentences. The girlfriend, um, Roman Protasevich, um, the journalist who was um, sort of kidnapped um, after the plane hijacking a couple of years ago, was sentenced to six years. Can you give us your understanding of the dynamics of Lukashenko's political crackdown and how you interpret that? This is the sign of his fragility and vulnerability. Uh, right now, they're looking for enemies inside of the system. Among those who are in prisons right now, uh, there are many officers, many um, officials who were working for the regime for many, many years. This is how totalitarian systems are always uh, behaving. You know, after they crack down on opponents, they're starting to look for opponents inside themselves. Uh, I, I want to see the hope here that it can collapse at any moment. At some point, Lukashenko will start uh, cleansing in his own uh, security apparatus in KGB. And uh, I see that even people around him, they feel threatened by this repression. But uh, it's very bad for the society in the long run. Because for people, this normalization of repressions, it's uh, very painful. All these groups, structures, NGOs, not only political ones, they are being destroyed right now. And for us, even after democratic changes, it will take many years to restore, to revive our society and civil society structures. Um, uh, Even, you know, the fact that so many people are in exile right now, we speak about half a million who left Belarus after 2020, there is no guarantee that many of them will come back. So in the longer run, the consequences will be dramatic. In the short run, the level of repression can actually crack the system from inside. Uh, But I don't believe that only this factor will play a role. I think the combination of different factors, a Ukrainian war, uh, economic uh, sanctions and consequences for economy, plus internal repressions, this all can create this pressure from inside and will lead to changes. Franak, thank you so much for joining us today to talk us through Belarus, um, the Lukashenko regime, and what we can also hope for um, in the coming months and years. From me, Yuria Zhoja, and my friends, Giselle Donnelly and Dalibor Rohaj. Thank you for listening to the Eastern Front. If you enjoyed this episode, please consider subscribing, rating, and reviewing us. To stay up to date with the Eastern Front, please give us a follow on Twitter at Eastern Front Pod and sign up for our newsletter through the link included in the show notes. You can find more episodes and additional content on our website, AI.org, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Thank you, and until next time, goodbye.